Good evening. Welcome to the Sunderland Select Board meeting. Today is Monday, December 7th, and uh, we're starting a few minutes late. We're just having some technical issues. So um, <clears throat> tonight on our agenda, we've got our minutes. We've got a request for a temporary ice rink at Riverside Park. Uh, we have uh, an FCECS radio upgrade discussion. I can see our both our chiefs there. We've got some license renewals. We've got a review of the Board of Assessors Administrative Assistant job description. We've got our COVID-19 update and then any other updates and any uh, public comments. So let's, uh, let's get it rolling and uh, let's start with our minutes from November 30th. <clears throat> And that was just uh, Scott and I last week. Motion. We have a motion. Do I have a second on those? So that was our tax classification hearing, Mr. Chair, in which yes. the tax rate was set at. It was. $15.49 a thousand with a 57 cents to the uh, water district. So. Correct. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll uh, heard a motion. I'll second. All right. All those in favor for the minutes of the 30th? Aye. 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 All right. Three to zero on that. I close the window. What's that? I said I get to close the window. There you yeah, go. Right, right. One, One down. <laughs> We're going to leave more. 17 more open, Tom. <clears throat> That's right. And uh, next up, we've got a request for a temporary ice rink. And I see Tracy Sacri out there. How are you? Hi, everybody. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Tracy. It's nice to see all of you and doing well. So um, yeah, I, this is almost like a, you know, rewind and repeat type situation. Yeah. <laughs> For those of us that weren't here, um, when we did this last time, it was a few years ago, and the um, local Cub Scout and Boy Scout um, pack and troop um, had a big volunteer sort of um, community that proposed to do this for the town um, to be open to the public. Um, and it was not only open during the day, but um, we had another volunteer who's on the Zoom tonight who helped us out with some lighting. So it was open into the evening. Um, the fire department was a big partner in that um, a few years ago. And we've reached out to them this year and Steve and I have been in touch and they're willing to, you know, do the flooding and help us with that and even have nice. some material to help possibly um, help to edge the surrounding of it to perhaps make it a little bit bigger. But the location that we had it in the past was at the volleyball court behind Town Hall, which is adjacent or part of now the Riverside Park area. Um, and so we, I've talked to, you know, I've got um, quite a few families that are willing to participate in, um, and my husband, John, who's willing to, you know, to try to recreate that. Um, we, we were, um, Mike Wisman has offered to purchase the liner for it, which was wonderful to have that um, contribution. So it's a nice collective effort from many nice. corners of the community. Um, but, you know, we still need a hand. Um, and actually, if there's anybody listening to this in the world that, you know, is really a guru of outdoor ice rinks, you know, we're not pros and we would um, really solicit your input and, and activeness in, in, the, in the, you know, production of it all. Um, so, I don't really think tonight I'm asking for any, oh, and we talked with Rec. Rec has been very much, Jim Ewing is very, um, you know, interested and um, in this and um, on board. So I think tonight more than anything, um, we're looking for permission. Um, and the goal would be, you know, weather depending would be to open it either New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. Um, you know, again, it would really be depending on when it could freeze, but we do have to get the sides up here before and the, you know, the braces the and perhaps the hose that we're going to be using to extend the, the size of it. Um, we do have to get that in the ground before it freezes. And I do need to talk to the volleyball group. Um, and um, so that's where we're at, guys. 
All right, that's great. I know it's been enjoyed in the past when we've had it, you know, so hopefully we'll get some cold weather and it'll stay frozen. Yeah. You know. Um, <clears throat> anybody have any um, general questions about it at all? The I would, I would, I'm 100% behind that. Um, I would, Tracy, if you could, could you talk to the Board of Health and just see? Um, yeah, for COVID. Um, and and I, I don't think they have a lot of things. I think they're basically, you talk about making sure, you know, the social distancing and those things take place. But we just want to be consistent with the governor's, uh, what he puts out there, okay? Yeah, Jim mentioned that also, that he just made an assumption that it would be a, you know, it's a public space. It would need, you know, it falls under all of those guidelines. But I have, I didn't think about the Board of Health. So I will do that. Yeah, just talk to, talk to, talk to Caitlin. Okay. Um, she's the chair and she'd be able to help you with that. Okay. They got their new email address too, right? Yep. Anything else I haven't thought of like that? Mm. So is it, yeah. so it's green light? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think so. Do we need any signage, you know, about for, well, perhaps it might be for the Board of Health. We might need one sign there about the rules. Yeah, COVID rules. Yeah, okay. that's probably a good idea. Yep. Okay. And and if there's a sign, any signage that needs to be put up, uh, Jeff may be able to help you with the uh, with that. Our town administrator. Okay. Uh, we, Hi, we, Jeff. We, he'd be able to help um, get a real sign instead of a paper sign or something. Okay. <laughs> well, so it, we, it's just so that people know. Right. You know, you know, somebody out there standing with a sandwich board on them, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Okay. I'll, um, I'll keep you guys posted and, um, but otherwise we might just get rolling with it. Okay. Yeah. And it, okay. it seemed to have worked out in that spot in the past too, which is great. And it's uh, thanks to everybody for who's volunteered and who's going to volunteer and the mic for the liner and the fire department and the police department. That's great. Keep our fingers crossed for cold weather. Yeah, it right. just, it, we need to have something free and local yep. and healthy for people. It will be a long winter without some access to some recreation. So I think it's going to be great, you guys. I promise um, if the weather works out, it's going to be important and, or it will be healthy. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Tracy. <clears throat> all right. So next up, we've got a discussion about our radio upgrade. I know it's an exciting topic for all you guys. <laughs> so um, do you want to take start the discussion, Jeff, or? Sure. So um, I guess for, from a, a very high level, um, I think this, this precedes me by maybe a year, um, but the region wanted to, wanted to maybe, not the right word. The region is upgrading from a 400 megahertz band uh, radio system to an 800 megahertz band and, and joining the statewide um, service. And um, I think that we weren't exactly sure when implementation was gonna happen. I think there were fits and starts. Um, and so we had applied um, for a community compact IT grant uh, to cover that because they did cover radios in, in previous grant rounds. Um, unfortunately, it seems like we were not successful with that grant application. Um, so we just wanted to talk about sort of um, you know, and then I think that one of the things is, and either chief, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but once the switch over happens, the radios that we currently have are, are not going to be co uh, connected to the emergency radio system. So um, <clears throat> it's kind of a, a necessity um, to do this upgrade and to be part of the system. And I will say that, that the state uh, executive office of 
safety and security, that's not right. Something like that. EOTS um, is providing FERCOG with about a two and a half or $2.7 million grant to help offset some of the costs of the radios. Um, and so I, I think that basically we wanted to talk about, and I think implementation is starting in January and the hope is to complete it by May. Um, so did I, I think that's a very brief general overview of sort of why we're here and talking about this. If either the chiefs want to jump in and talk more specifics. Well, yeah, well, the, sure. go, ahead. <laughs> go ahead. No, Eric, go ahead. You. Uh, I mean, as far as I, I know the, on the, the police side, there's been a lot of discussion regarding uh, the police bandwidth uh, merging with the rest of the county. <clears throat> we do, like Jeff said, operate on a 400 megahertz. Uh, the idea is we'd be joining the COMIRS system, the C-O-M-I-R-S system. Uh, that system would enable us to um, have better quality radios, better quality system. Uh, the system that you guys have been operating on before I got here and then the past four, just over four years, um, has been some, some pitfalls on the UHF system. The towers in a lot of the systems are, are dying, if not already dead. Uh, so this is a, a time where like, like Jeff said, they're, they're looking at increasing um, our ability to get radios. Uh, a lot of the radios that we're able to get uh, through this system now are at a uh, significantly less cost than if we wanted to purchase one um, outside of the system. Uh, to give you an idea, a, a fire truck radio or a police car radio um, could cost anywhere between 4,600 to uh, 8,000. Uh, per radio. And that's not including a repeater system. Uh, a repeater system inside each vehicle uh, would cost about $12,500 per vehicle. Um, so the, the grant that we wrote was uh, about $152,000 grant, um, hoping for you know the ability of getting uh, four repeaters per department, fire and police, uh, and then getting um, <clears throat> the install costs, the radio costs, um, the accessory costs, and any upgrades for multiband or anything like that. Uh, so like, like I said, the, the initial radio grant was about 152,000. Um, knowing that we don't have that uh, after we were unsuccessful in the grants, uh, we've had to go through back to the drawing board and make some cutbacks on um, certain items. Uh, and I think that what I, gave to Jeff is a pretty decent uh, showing of what we need, the breakdown of what each item shows and uh, the overall costs, um, which is about half of um, the grant that it's at 75,000. Well, the, the radio, the whole radio thing has been going on for probably five or six years, if not longer. Um, it's, it's, been a long, it's been a long thing. And the problem is, is we, don't, you don't, we don't have the option of not doing anything, just maintaining, because if we do nothing, then we're not gonna have a radio system because we depend on, on the, the, the county system right now for the operation of the system that allows us to communicate with one another. Um, the difference in the 400 versus 800, there's a lot of reasons why uh, they don't work. One reason is that the new 800 megahertz system is a digital system versus the older 400 is a analog system. Um, they, they don't work analog and digital are separate systems, so they don't work the other is a frequency. We don't have the ability to run on the 800 with our 400 megahertz equipment. Um, it's it's been a concern for a, a long time. Um, I believe Stephen, Eric, correct me. If, um, but you guys have gone out with an 800 megahertz system and find to look for areas where you don't have good reception or no reception, right? Versus the 400 megawatt system. 
Yeah, we did. That was not this past summer, but the summer before. And we went around, I want to say we checked 120 or 150 different spots around town. And they were primarily on Mount Toby, some of the popular recreation areas where we find ourselves using radios. Also, uh, some of the notorious bad spots in town uh, with our current radio system that we wanted to try with the digital system. And what we identified was um, the digital radios either work or they don't. And when you're talking about radios, at, at first blush, that sounds kind of obvious, but currently with our radios, there's a lot of places where you can hear just enough to figure out what's going on. It's not crystal clear, but it's, it's serviceable. Uh, with the digital radios, you either hear it like you're standing next to the person you're talking to, or there's nothing. And we identified, we're pleasantly surprised. There were a lot of areas where we got good reception. There were a handful where we got poor reception um, and another handful where we got nothing. The biggest challenge is the areas where we got nothing were the basements of the apartment buildings, some of the other larger structures in town where um, you might say for any uh, public safety person, those are the places where you'd have the most hazards and you might need to ask for help the most often. Um, and that's where the, uh, the repeater element comes in, um, whereby putting one of those devices in the fire truck or the police cruiser would allow it to essentially boost the signal coming out of the bad spots in the buildings and tying into the main um, system. The tricky part is um, they have adjusted the radio system since we did our tests with the promises that we'd have uh, better coverage. Uh, but in talking with some of my counterparts, uh, the occasional state trooper that we run into on different scenes, um, there are still concerns using the system without repeaters. And most of the departments that have jumped onto this in the eastern part of the state do have some repeater capability to eliminate those, uh, those questionable areas. So um, the states helped us out an awful lot with the radios themselves, um, the accessories and so forth. It's understandable that they'd want some skin in the game on our part for that. But um, the, the biggest element that Chief Demetropoulos and I have found that might be uncovered, uh, you might say, is the repeater side of it. And that's why we were able to um, knock that ask down a bit to get rid of some of the repeaters that we had asked for. So Chief, I had a question for you. Um, if you have, you have a fire or an emergency situation at one of the complexes and you're in the basement, or you could be in, in my basement, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so basically, you're, you're, have, you're gonna have trouble punching, punching through that basement, that, that masonry mass. I would say if, if you have something going on at one of our complexes, the first thing you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be calling for backup from the surrounding communities, right? Correct. Now you have, you have surrounding community firefighters, EMT people, inside those buildings or police, public safety people inside the basement of, the, of those complexes. Um, they're using, now, now I'm, I assume now that because with the 800 megahertz digital that you're gonna be able to communicate with these people now, they're gonna be able to communicate with you. They can't punch out of those buildings because there's no repeater on site. That doesn't sound like a very healthy way to do business to me. That's our biggest concern. Yeah. And while the, while the radios themselves and standing outside in the open and even first floor of some of the buildings, we're not talking about a widespread situation, but uh, it's enough of, of a percentage 
of the places in town that it's a concern and we can work around it with some capability. Um, we just, it doesn't look like we're gonna be able to get all the capability that we had wanted, if that makes any sense. It does. Will, will the repeaters resolve like all the issues once, you know, if once we're able to get them? They should. Yeah. Um, the, the whole process, you know, as it's been alluded to earlier, has been a, um, uh, we haven't had an extremely clear, uh, communication has been okay, but um, the timeline has been choppy and we've had different experiences from different, um, different experiences related from different entities. Um, some departments have a repeater on every truck. Some departments don't have any repeaters, but yeah. uh, every municipality is different with their relation to the main towers and on the uh, on the system and how it'll behave right so kind of in like tom's example you can't be guaranteed that you know one town may have a repeater the other one may not so you can't assume that somebody else who's coming in on a mutual aid call will have a repeater either depending on what's going on that's exactly right and there's a um there's a, a comment uh, by a gentleman here that i'm reading making reference to the um the digital system yep, at uh, uh, in a particular uh, particular place, and they did have to put some repeaters in. Now there is um, again, there's different uh, different elements to every town, but we're we're going to need some. It's a safe bet, right. and um, you know, that's where we are now. Uh, we don't have a definitive answer, but we've got the bare bones laid out. Yep. And kind of like what uh, Chief Dean Trappos was saying, it's kind of like when we switched over from regular analog television broadcast to digital. I mean, you get the signal great, and then it, it stops. So you either get it or you don't. So oh, right, it's not like you get a um, faint signal. Now, what we have to remember is that the system is going to have antennas, various antennas around Franklin County. Oh. Okay, so correct. And and are they still probably going to have one on top of on on top of Toby? It's my understanding that they will have Toby. There there was a map that was provided to us some time ago. Yeah, that showed the locations. There were there weren't going to be as many towers. Don't need them. Exactly. However, I want to say Toby, because of its proximation to the to the center of the county, as odd as it sounds, uh, we're not even close to being in the easternmost part here. Um, it was a good spot, also because of its reach down into Hadley and and surrounding areas. Amherst at the height. Yep, yep. makes sense. So 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 basically, basically, why we wouldn't need to have repeaters at diff why we the stationary repeaters is there there's just a few locations that that we have trouble getting in about in and out of because of the main antenna where the locations are and if you had stationary repeaters you still would have areas yeah, that spots. you couldn't cover that's true. And some of, if I may, some of the, the new apartment complex, um, uh, Route 116 flats, they were required to put a, a repeater system in for the current radio system hmm. uh, by law, by code. And there's an example of a place where there's, you know, there's repeaters there. Um, in talking with the state fire marshal's office, I've been advised that it's much more difficult to get existing buildings to comply with that requirement than it is brand new buildings. Absolutely. Because yeah. that's, believe me, that thought crossed my mind. Um, but, you know, people have the best of intentions. It's an investment like anything else. Uh, and the time that you spend negotiating with somebody to have that installed, you've got some exposure. 
Yeah. Are they like, for instance, one sixteen flats? Now they they get a repeater in, but eventually that system will be bricked like our radios will. Are they required to um, change that out at all? Uh, well, yes, and that's okay. going to be once once we have an answer on when the the system is going to quote unquote go live, and once would you know once we have our radios in hand, uh, have the orders in place. Um, I'm going to contact their ownership and make them aware of this change. Okay. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens with that, but you're absolutely right. That's anything that has to deal with, uh, um, non-digital radio. You got that right. It's going to be bricked. Put them in the Smithsonian. Yeah, pretty much <laughs> doorstop or whatever else, you know, true. Although the somewhat unique to the fire service and EMS not so much on the police side is they are still trying to figure out paging and dispatching over okay. the 800 megahertz system. That's one um, element of this where I'll speak for my peers and say, probably haven't got a, um, uh, a complete explanation of how it's going to work. But what we will be doing is working off of our old pagers and hmm. the old radio system in the immediate time frame for paging, okay, it's much less. Um, it, it's a little bit easier on the equipment and so forth um, to page off of the old system than have the talk around radio system um, working. And then they're they're saying that they will uh, once the talk around features are up, they're going to work on paging. So the old radio system is still going to be Frankenstein together probably for a year or two for that purpose. Um, but once we get a definitive answer on how to page off of the 800 megahertz, we're going to abandon that too. So we've got the financing issue for this, right, Jeff? Right. That's, that's the, uh, yeah. the next issue. And I was talking to, Chief Demetropoulos about it this morning, and he mentioned that in the beginning, um, Furcog had talked about the option of potentially having a zero interest loan, um, which I am looking into if that's something that the COG is still offering is at least a temporary bridge um, to get us to town meeting and then perhaps putting in a, a capital request. Um, for, for the oh, rest yeah. of the cost and um, you know we're still combing grant sites and seeing if there are other potential options um, that we can reduce our costs further but yeah I think it, it's getting a, a clear picture from FERCOG about when we actually need to purchase this by and, and what our options are um, if we have to do it before town meeting. Yeah. The way that it's been explained to me, Jeff, is that there's a few um, stages where towns may purchase a few windows, if you will. And the last one is in May, if I'm not mistaken. And I, I took the liberty of telling the, uh, the, the folks that I've been dealing with um, who asked for our, our timeline on that, that we would be looking at the later um, purchase date. Uh, I don't think it's a problem if we decide to move up, uh, but uh, felt the need to give ourselves as much room as possible. Yeah. That'd work out with the timing of our town meeting then probably. With that Except last that one. it would still be a fiscal year 22 capital <laughs> expense, so we wouldn't That's actually true. Yep. be able to the spend it for July. Hmm. So we're gonna to have to do a little more homework to figure out what we can do and base our proposal around that. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> it's not like we didn't know this was gonna happen. It's true. I've right. been talking about it for a while, right? It's just a matter of the financing mechanism and everything and what we can squeeze in. And maybe, maybe we come up with a multi-year plan where we, you know, here's our, short-term goals and then see what we can phase in over the next, you know, couple of years or whatever after for, that. For equipment? Yeah, for like additional repeaters or something like that. 
Oh, I mean, yeah, definitely the repeaters, but but yeah. the cost they budgeted out on the Excel spreadsheet, that is based on what they're giving for, for cost now. Right. And if we're not part of that purchase process, the radios are going to double. Yep. These radios we're looking at getting at a fraction of the cost. And if we were to purchase them next year, they're at the full 5000 instead of 3000 or whatever. Yeah, um, we, we want to avoid that. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, just so you're aware, uh, prior to me coming here, I want to say that the, the, the police chief before me had received a, um, a radio line item uh, approval that you guys put, I think, just over $6,000 into. Uh, since I've been here, I've asked Brian to roll that over every year because mm -hmm. I knew why would we spend money on radios that were going to be junk in three, four, five years. Right. So we still have that six grand. I know in comparison, okay. but if we had to get this number down from 75 to 69 for a little bit of breathing room, we have that money still. So okay. just know we still have that line sitting there. We haven't spent it. It's just sitting there. So one other little thing we can think about there, Jeff. All right. <clears throat> Maybe we'll get lucky and get some more grants. You never know. I'm trying. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Ask for them for Christmas, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Steve uh, and I kind of do our part to look like Santa. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite the right color yet, but you know. Mine is. Steve's is. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. It's it's getting there. But there are, you know, Jeff. This morning you sent out there was a notice of funding opportunity for a, a state grant. A small one. Um, we've been looking into that. The challenges for our uh, our, um, our census in town, it's we we max out at ten thousand dollars for the grant amount. Um, we'll have to look and see if that's ten thousand per organization or per town. I think it's per town. Um, so for the for the small ticket items, we could scoop some stuff up if we were able to get that. But unfortunately, for the larger ticket items, um, we're going to have to keep digging. Right. And when this IT grant comes back out, uh, I think Jeff had said two more years. Um, you know, we'll just have to keep a calendar alert that's, hey, it's time to reapply. <laughs> that's and right. We apply right. for, you know, a whole mess of at that point. Yep. Yeah. Make, that's a good idea. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Uh, anybody have any other questions or comments on that topic? We'll keep digging away in the meantime and see what we can come up with. In the meantime, you can look up articles on things to do with out-of-date uh, radios, right? <laughs> Send them Recycle overseas. Recycle them. Send them overseas, right? Somebody else Send will Well, there probably is a market somewhere for them, I would imagine, right? The old ones? No. There's no, yeah. there's no one. They Nobody don't, wants they, them. It's very difficult for you to get service now. Yeah. Unfortunately, David. Ah, yeah. That's too bad. We won't be picking up spare departmental cash on eBay with the old radios, I guess, right? Not anything substantial. No. Um, but while one last thing, while they, yeah. I forgot to add it in, while uh, we are still using our pagers over the old system, yep. there will, that will be running. So there will be the ability, ability for us to use the old radio is similar to a walkie talkie type of thing to okay. talk amongst ourselves, but we can't talk with dispatch, Shelburne okay. control or anybody else. So there's you know, a very small window of light for us to use those for traffic control or something like that maybe, but yep. um, we don't want to trust it for anything more uh, significant than that. Okay. Something to keep in mind. Mm. Thanks. All right. Thanks for joining us tonight, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. You're welcome. Thanks. Have a good night. Good good night everybody. All right. Next up is license renewals. <clears throat> we were spending a lot of time signing those. Now, usually we vote in like a block of those. Jeff, are there any issues with insurance or inspections at this point? Nope, at this point, everybody has turned everything in. Everything's in good shape. Um, the only one 
the uh, uh, is not renewing his um, demos, I think. Yeah. Uh, yep. Which. And there was one that uh, I think one or two noted that um, they're waiting for like fees to be paid or something like that. Now, do we have to include that in a separate vote? Contingent on. Okay. Because that would be good if we can do it all and then for that one contingent on up, yeah. up to date. Um, were, were those the notes in the folder or in the spreadsheet? In the uh, folder, in the folder yep. Okay. There, yeah, there are sticky notes in there. So uh, yeah, so if we can do that as a contingent. Yeah, I mean, I, I know, for example, the, the fee for um, the bar is, is not going to be known until they're allowed to open. So right. that, that could explain why we didn't accept to get a fee right. from them. Yeah, it um, makes sense. Because that's still an unknown, unfortunately. So, Well, that's the case, uh, Mr. Chair. I'd, I'd move the slate and uh, as presented. Second. All okay. right. All those in favor of the uh, slate for license renewals as presented? Aye. Aye. All right. Three to zero on that. Um, next up is, uh, why don't we um, do the review of the Board of Assessors thing afterwards and we'll do our state of emergency update because I see Lori out there. So why don't we do that first and then we'll go back to the review. Hey, Lori. Hi there. How are you? I'm doing well and yourselves. Hmm. All right. <laughs> How are we looking this week? Well, to jump right into it, um, December 2nd, we had one positive and three close. December 3rd, we had two positive and two close. December 4th, we had one positive. December 7th, today, we had two positive. Um, so for the two week period, if you look backwards from today to November 23rd, we're still at 12 and 12 okay. was the same number reported. Um, on December 3rd, when the latest data came out, the latest two week data came out. So we're pretty even there. It's, uh, that's good, I guess. You know, it's better than going up. It is better than going up, yes. Yeah, I agree. Hopefully, it won't get too bad with the holidays kicking in, but you never know. So, <clears throat> yeah, well, UMass has started, you know, they're offering the community testing. So yes, more testing is going to mean more numbers. You know, it's, it's kind of inevitable. Right. Yeah, <clears throat> that's true. And um, that info, I guess, I got loaded up on the site, right, Jeff, about the testing at UMass? Yep, Cindy did okay. that this afternoon. <clears throat> yep, I saw that. All right, so that's good. So people can go to the website and look if they need to be tested. They can make, I believe it's by appointment, correct? Yep, yes. you can sign up yeah. through the website, and I think it starts uh, the, a week from today. Fourteenth, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, so that's a good option. Can, can I? Can I just? You said if you have to get tested, that's it's if you want, you want to, get to, yeah. tested, want to get tested. Want to get tested? Yes. Not true. about in in a, It's for asymptomatic residents of the town of Sunderland. You can go to UMass. Edu backslash COVID and it'll answer all your questions, but you can sign up Monday through Thursday to go to the university, the Mullen Center, you park in parking lot number 25, which is on their site. You can find out what, what it's right next to the Mullen Center and you can go in and get a rapid test at no charge, as long as you're 10 years of age or older. And you also have to, um, um, a register for an appointment and a specific time. But if, if you think you've got COVID, you don't go. That's, that's different. That's yeah. a system. <laughs> that's total. Different if, you, test. If, if you just want to know, you go to take the test. Asymptomatic testing only. Right. Like you came in, so maybe be, you thought you came into contact with somebody potentially and you don't have any symptoms. This is a good way. Well, what, what you do is that you ask yourself a, a, and they ha on the site, they have the list of questions. And do you have a headache, loss of taste, loss of smell, uh, cough, 
uh, runny nose, sore throat, fever. And if you answer no to all those questions, then you can go. That's asymptomatic. If you have any of those, if you have any of those symptoms, you need to call your uh, primary care provider and okay. schedule a, uh, a test for because you have some of the symptoms. But these are for asymptomatic testing. But if you go to umass.edu backslash COVID, that, that'll answer all your questions. Highly recommend that you go. I'm there, I get tested once a week. It's a, no one, no one puts anything in your nose. It's all done by, by you. You go in, you, you do have to have an email account. They give you a vial, they give you a swab. You go to a private location, open swab, follow the instructions. It's pretty simple. Yeah, well, it's good to know. <clears throat> it was like a good public service message, Tom. Uh, I have, I've been doing <laughs> it for the last. I well, And you repeated so. everything at the end, too, which I was about to say. I appreciated that. Well, you, you, you know, and, and, and the thing is, I it it, it it's. I, I have had conversations with residents of the community that, that have had a hard time getting a test. Yep. Um, they, they wanted a test. And, and I've, I've known people that have gone to Springfield. I've known people that have gone up to Greenfield. Um, but there, are, there, there have been very few test sites locally available. And I think, Lori, I think will we'll back me up on this one, is that... Um, Testing should be easy. Testing should be some, and 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 you said it early, David. That you, and and Lori said it also that the more testing, the more cases. Well, guess what? If you know that you have, if through testing you, and the greatest thing about the testing is that you allow you allow the contact tracing to start sooner, exactly. and that helps prevent it. All right. I have, I, and again, this is for for right now. I I understand what the the fatality rate is from COVID, and and I know where it stands right now. One of the reasons that that more people aren't dying from COVID is because of the the wonderful care that's offered by our our medical systems, the the hospitals and. And if and just but right now though though that system is bursting at the seams in many places, so we just have to try to, you know, lessen lessen the impact on the ICUs and the hospitals so that they get they have beds available for people that 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 are of serious need, and testing if you do have testing, on and like you said earlier, David, is people, you know, people go someplace or they, they think they're exposed to someone, the best way to, to, to confirm it is if you have your testing. So it's a, it makes a, it's big a good difference. thing. Yeah, it's yeah. a good thing. I, yeah, it's it a wonderful. Yeah. And I would, I would encourage everybody if you, if, if you, if you can go and I'm Monday through Thursday, I think it's nine to four schedule an online appointment and go get tested. Yeah, it's a I very know. simple thing to do. Now, like Tom was saying, they've got a lot of good information information out on the website, so that's great. Um, anything um, else, Laurie? I did check with um, both the chief of police and the fire chief as far as PPE goes. Yep. They are in need of some, so I asked Jeff for his resource for um, getting, because the, there's a couple of state contracts, I guess, and yep. Jeff passed that information along to Steve and to Eric. Okay, good, good. Because I think we're still using the COG too, right? It was one, or it's one of the options now? Okay. No. All right. <clears throat> so that's good. Hopefully they can resolve their PPE issues, and get that taken care of. <laughs> I know Steve said he's ordered some, but they haven't received a confirmation date yet. So. Okay. They didn't get the uh, Amazon shipping thing yet, huh? Apparently not. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe check the back door or something, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. All right. Thanks, Lori. Appreciate You're it. Welcome. Any, any, um, any other 
COVID related things from your office, Jeff at all? No, the only thing that I wanted to add was, uh, I think last week when we talked, um, Sunderland had been in the, the yellow category and then this most recent, we were back in the green. So I think that that's, yeah. you know, just the, the two week period, just wanted to let people know where, where we stood in the most recent um, town by town report. Okay. Next color we're shooting for is what, gray, I think? Yep. Yes. It's a strange color scheme, but okay. <laughs> gray, it's forgettable. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Good point. Good point. Well, like beige, they should just call it, right? You just blend yep. into beige. Yep. All right. Thanks. Yep. Good night. <clears throat> Good night. All right. So now we've got the review of the Board of Assessors administrative job description. Do you want to? Pull that up at all, or yeah. <clears throat> Teresa was kind enough to go through and edit it, which was nice and updated, so it reflects what she's been doing, which is good. We discussed that at our last personnel committee meeting too. So, <clears throat> oh, there we go. So I think it probably gives a better and more accurate reflection of the roles and responsibilities and what we had in there before, which is nice. Because <clears throat> actually she was at our last um, personnel committee meeting too. And it was good that she gave us a nice overview too of, of all the, the different things. And there's a lot of interfaces um, and keeping an eye on vendors and things like that in that role. And, um, and honestly too, I mean, that role can um, help increase or, you know, income in that sense, you know, by really following through on a lot of things too. <clears throat> so I think it's important as we look at rehiring her that we get that as up to date as we can. I, I read through it. I didn't have any, um, any key issues that jumped out at all, Jeff. I think okay. Yeah. So I, I think part of this is, a, I, you know, going through the, the policies book said the, the personnel committee recommends it to the select board. And so um, this is just a, a final review. I think as far as the, the hours that pretty much stayed the same, um, the assessor's admin assistant has been part of the, the wage study. So I think that the, the, wages that would be offered or should be at this point in line with what other communities are paying. So um, right. as David said, it, it, it was really sort of tweaking it and bringing things up to date with regard to technology and, and the vendors that we use and uh, the responsibilities of the admin assistant and how they interact with, with the board itself. And she's done a great job, I think, of upgrading the technological use and everything there too, and really embracing the things like GIS, which has been fantastic. So you're looking for a motion to uh, approve? Yeah, and then and then I think I would start posting it and, and yep. trying to find somebody and, and bringing people in to interview. And start that process. I'd, yeah. move, I'd, yeah. I'd make that motion. All right. Second. We have a second. All right. All those in favor of approval and moving forward with the position replacement? Aye. Aye. All right. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, with that, now we go to our select board updates section of the meeting. Turn it over to either of you guys if you have any updates. Um, I just want to. Uh... Remind all that uh, 79 years ago, the uh, on this date, it, um, Pearl Harbor was bombed, and lost 2,400 service individuals, um, men and women. I uh, at that time they thought it was going to be uh, again the war that was end all wars, and we know that that unfortunately hasn't been true. But I just you know are we're I, I 
I think at one time I've read it was like 16 million Americans served in the Second World War um, in armed forces, 16 million. And that probably doesn't include um, all the merchant mariners that sailed as well, because at the time they weren't oh. considered they they weren't considered part of the armed forces at that time. But uh, I, I I just I know we're losing the last of our World War II veterans that that remember. So I just wanted to, I just want to bring that up that um, 79 years ago that. The United States entered into the Second World War. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Any updates, Scott, this week? Uh, last week, Mr. Chair, we uh, have come to a memorandum of understanding with the police department about the uh, wage increase. I want to thank uh, Jeff and the chief for their work on that, as well as the union uh, for leaving that reopener in place. Uh, to allow for decision to be made once our uh, revenues forecasts and our comfort level with those forecasts uh, began to gel. So uh, we have that MOA here to sign and uh, they asked for and have agreed to the same increase that the, uh, that the personnel committee recommended for uh, non-union staff. So again, I wanna thank, I wanna thank the department for their work and the, uh, the union for um, just fact-based negotiating. It's just really healthy. And these days, it's greatly appreciated. Yep. Sure is. All right, thanks. And we had our personnel committee meeting last Tuesday, and um, we got another one. Do we schedule our next one, Jeff? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I think, I think it's a, a week from tomorrow. From tomorrow, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. All right, so we'll be having that. <clears throat> um, but uh, any updates for you, Jeff? Probably been a quiet week once again, right? Yeah, yeah. The the only thing I wanted to mention um, is that uh, Senator Comerford is having a virtual town hall tomorrow at five p.m. Um, right. She's going to go over some of some of the stuff that they've been working on and will be working on, and just a sort of PSA for that. Oh, that's a good. Uh... It's a good thing that get some good updates through those. All right, Mr. Chair, if I could, Jeff, yeah. do we have the MO a copy of the uh, MOA to sign. Yeah, was it not in the to be signed? I printed it. If it was it, in it's one not of the, in the folders. folder, I, it's on my desk, and I'll get it okay. over there. If, if that's the case, then I'd, I'd make a motion to sign that sign. MOA with a police union based on right. for the wage increase of two percent retroactive in this budget year. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. It's good to wrap that up. <clears throat> we'll be back at it in six weeks. It's, yep. only, a, it's, <laughs> only, it's, it's only a one-year contract. Again, I think uh, it was it was very fact-based, and I really appreciated the style of uh, negotiating. Oh, that's good. It's been it's been one of those years for one-year contracts. So, <clears throat> all right. And uh, do we have any public comments at all this evening? All right. I think um, that probably about wraps it up. Our next meeting will be next Mr. Monday. Nope. Yes. Yeah. Um, we do have an executive session scheduled, and, and the purpose is just to um, minutes. approve minutes from previous right. executive sessions. Thank you for that reminder. I forgot we rescheduled that. Um, Yep, so we'll be exiting out of this meeting to go into executive session. We'll be only returning to this meeting to adjourn. Um, let me just see which one. Do we have an item on this list for just the minutes? Uh, I think it's under any general law is how it's captured, Mr. Chair. Yeah. All right. Number seven? I think so, yeah. yeah. Yep. Sorry, right. so we to comply with or act under the authority of any general or special law or federal grant in aid requirements. Right. We have to do a roll call vote for this. Do we have a motion to go into executive session? Motion. All right. I'll second. Second. All right. And a roll call vote. Mr. Bergeron? Aye. 
Mr. Feitenkiewicz? Aye. Aye. All right, and again, we'll be returning only to adjourn for the regular meeting. And to remind the public, we're only going in to review minutes for a couple of meetings. That's and right. They become public. Yep, it'll be a quick one, so. <clears throat> Great, thank you. All right, thanks.